my part, and then we'll take some questions afterward if there are any. At the end, if we're lucky, we'll also show our live running demonstration of an experiment of the machine you see on the screen. Um, would like to uh, thank Dave and Steve for everything they've done to make this conference very enjoyable. Uh, would also like to, uh, Dr. Cravens and I would like to thank our uh, sponsor, Industrial Heat, in particular, Mr. Tom Darden, Mr. J.T. Vaughn, and Mr. Dewey Weaver. They've been great to work with for the last few years. Uh, we couldn't ask for better partners in research, and we look forward to doing better work in the future. Um, I built this, or designed it, and had it built in Austin, Texas. Uh, it's kind of a fancy looking machine, but it's basically uh, a gas system <clears throat> that utilizes um, CBEC calorimetry uh, around the main device in its thermal enclosure. You see uh, nice looking rings there, Helmholtz coils. I haven't gotten a chance to use those yet, but uh, one day I hope to be able to cancel all magnetic fields and see if the effect goes away because I strongly believe that magnetic fields are involved or at least important. Uh, my design intent for this uh, CBEC and reactor was something that Mike discussed earlier today, and that is uh, establishing the science by being able to show that, in this case, uh, light hydrogen does not work to produce excess power, but heavy hydrogen does, which we were successful in showing that. The second part of my design intent was to uh, make it get bigger, to scale it up so we'd have a commercial product for our sponsors to uh, utilize. Uh, so far, I have not succeeded in doing that in spite of all of Dr. Craven's good advice. Uh, we haven't exceeded about 10 watts. We've, we get five to seven watts once in a while, two to three all the time. We can't shake the small numbers. Uh, the calorimetry seems to be pretty sound. Uh, down the center of the copper block, we put a one inch reactor tube about a foot long, as you can see on the right side. And uh, its purpose is to get hot as heck and to send heat out to the uh, environment and interact with CBEC chips or Peltier chips along the way and put out a scalable voltage. The reactor itself is made out of 316L stainless. Uh, it's about a foot long, inch in OD. Uh, I put um, motor magnets, clamshell magnets, around the uh, tube during operation to uh, take advantage of any magnetic fields. We put about a 230 gauss field on the inner wall. I plate hydrogen absorbing material on the inner wall in a separate bath using electrochemical methods. Uh, the case is grounded cathode negative and the center rod, which is moly in this case, could be tungsten or any tough metal, uh, works as anode. So we're kind of doing electrochemistry in a gas environment. That was my goal, is to be able to slam those deuterons into that sidewall and produce excess heat. Uh, I've been successful uh, quite often, but not uh, as often as I was with electrochemical methods using dual lasers or single lasers, particularly dual lasers. One of the features here, uh, we can monitor pressure, <clears throat> and as the pressure declines inside the tube, that indicates that the deuterons are going into the uh, plated material. And uh, that is trackable, but it's only loosely correlated with uh, loading, I fear. Our typical operating conditions, we hit Mike's minimum around 200 C, 10 tor, 350 volts, and 200 milliamps. Our thermal enclosure is very important. It's a commercial Kelvinator freezer. Uh, its purpose is to keep the background temperature very flat and stable at our set point of either 28 or I sometimes use 32. We have lots of vigorous air stirring inside the space. Uh, one important feature, uh, other than the four thermo, uh, thermocouples, is the horizontal cartridge heater right above the, uh, uh, the fans that serves to put enough heat to balance against the uh, cooling compressors and to keep the uh, temperature solid and, and flat. As you can see to the right, it's really pretty stable long term. Another feature that Dr. Cravens will talk about in his part, if we are lucky enough to produce five, six, seven watts in the reactor, that heat flows out of the, into the workspace, into the enclosure, and does work on that enclosure. It warms it up, and LabVIEW can relax the power going into the heater, and you can actually see that in real time, and Dr. Uh, Cravens will go 
over that in his talk. Uh, we use thermoelectric modules from Ontario, Canada, French speaking. I think uh, Jean Paul asked me about them, but the great company, TechTag Manufacturing. <clears throat> we use a 350C model. Uh, you can go up to 850 if you're patient and rich. Um, we installed them using, uh, I use a proto shop, uh, prototype shop in Austin <clears throat> named Agilent Technologies. Uh, Mike Garina is the principal there, and his right hand guy, uh, Carlos Job, did all of the prototyping and shop drawings. They did a beautiful job. Uh, they attached uh, the Peltier chips to the uh, uh, copper block uh, with machine plates, as you can see. And then uh, we don't cover all of the uh, reactor uh, surface, but we cover, this, we cover the same amount every time. So it's very consistent results. In the lower right-hand corner, you'll see Belleville washers that are used to keep the heat sinks uh, closely and consistently coupled with the Peltier chips so you get a nice heat transfer to everything. Um, all of the uh, voltages from the various Peltier chips are uh, sent to an Agilent data logger in series and read that way. And uh, we can scale and calibrate the voltage versus power in a very reliable way. System has three main components. On the far left, we store the, uh, I store the power supplies, or like nine, and a computer. The center is the enclosure uh, with the device inside under uh, uh, high temperature insulation to get the temperature up to 200. On the far right, we see the pressure system, pressure measurement, and the TurboLab 80. A uh, little closer view here. Uh, we store the hydrogen, sorry about the voice. <clears throat> we store the hydrogen in uh, canisters called hydrosticks. On the left is deuterium, the right is uh, hydrogen, uh, light hydrogen. And we can select electronically between the two, and that's flowed into the reactor through a Sierra 101 mass flow controller. Slows everything down so you can control the pressure reliably. We have a place here to hook in and take gas samples uh, manually, uh, or you can use an RGA. We'd have to rig up a few things. I have one ordered, so I'm going to get into the RGA business soon. Um, we press, uh, measure pressure with an MKS Baritron, high accuracy. We use a TurboLab 80. It takes us down to 10 to the minus 8th most of the time. Uh, very good, reliable system. On top of the freezer, we have several important instruments. Uh, the one on the top is a high 480-volt uh, ballast that uh, our new colleague, Bob Higgins, recommended, and I took him up on that, and it has served to dampen down the discharge uh, violence, if you will, so we can get good measurements on voltage and current. Uh, we constantly look for uh, AC signals on top of the DC. Uh, we haven't seen any yet. And behind it, we have an RF generator that can be amplified and coupled over the DC for triggering purposes. And I've seen a little results with that, but not uh, as much as I would like. Seebeck performance, in a word, is slow. Uh, it's a huge thermal mass. It takes 12 to 15 hours to get a result. But once you get there, it's very stable. Um, the, uh, we use three reporting methods. Seebeck uh, voltage calibration, we can back off the heater power. We look at that. If we make five, if the Seebeck shows five watts uh, by its method, we can look at the back off power as a secondary method of the heater, and it generally matches quantitatively within a half a watt or a watt. Uh, we also have access to a simulation method that Bob Higgins has developed, and he'll talk about that, I believe, on Thursday. Um, the uh, Bob Higgins is a new uh, colleague and friend, and he's multi-talented. I mean, he is, uh, can do a jillion things uh, and do them very well. Uh, retired Motorola engineer, I believe. Uh, so you'll be seeing more of him uh, in the near future. He's got a great lab, too. Can't say enough good about Bob. Uh, at this part is where the fun starts. Dr. Cravens is going to take over and uh, discuss the experiments that came out of this device. And at the end of his part, if we're lucky, we'll see the live experiment running in Austin uh, right now. Uh, it got shut off last night for some reason by an electrical storm, so we're restarting it so you'll get to see it approach break even if the cold fusion gods bless us. So now for Dr. Cravens.
I want to make sure that I thank Industrial Heat for their financial, moral, encouragement, and that sort of thing. It's been great. Uh, they're straight shooters, as we say in New Mexico. Uh, I will also want everybody to know that Let's is the one that did all the work. I just go along for the ride. Uh, and thirdly, I'll be using general uh, numbers and all to make things go a little smoother and faster. What you see here, and it's hard to point on two of these at once, but this is uh, an infrared picture of our device. Uh, you notice that the uh, main heat is coming down about the lower third or so. This is the, the tube on a ring stand uh, and we do infrared pictures to make sure we got our in, uh, insulation correct, that the, everything's going right, that the wires aren't overheating in a wrong place and that sort of stuff. You actually can do a little calorimetry with that, but I don't trust infrared uh, and optical methods very well when I've got a C-back. And I hope it means that I just pushed the center one. Yes. Uh, the first thing you should ask is, does it respond to the heat in a reasonable way? Uh, and this is our calibration curve. You notice that the blue one is the heat into our block. That's a big copper block, three inches by three inches by 15, I think it is. Uh, and it goes up in stair steps. The red is what we calculate from the Seebeck voltage. Uh, this is a calibration run. Notice that the red is below the blue at the beginning because you're storing energy into that copper block. Then as you come back down, it's a little delay because it's releasing that. Uh, we're usually be running between 200 and 300 watts into that copper block to keep it warm because we're wor working at 200 something degrees. Uh, you, so that tells us the calibration is right, and in fact, you can, we can go back two years past, and that calibration, if we use it, it's, we're not more than a fraction of a percent off. So it's a nice, stable system. Uh, also, if we do a closed loop type calibration, starting and stopping on the same temperature, and do the difference between those, it comes out near zero, which means that our energy measurements will be right, the integrated power. So uh, that's the calibration. The first thing, and this is for Mike, wherever he is now, to, uh, uh, he likes correlation. This is uh, to show that the high voltage applied to it is required for our excess heat. Uh, you see the blue line is the heat into this copper block and the way that we've got lab view set up is that the power into the heaters of the block and the power into the uh, high voltage, the sum of them, it tries to keep uh, constant. So when you flip on the high voltage, of course, it, it goes mm, and it's got to learn just a minute, their differential thing in a proportional heater, and then it brings it back to the 200 uh, watts for the sum of it. So you turn on the high voltage, this is the sum of the block heater and the high voltage which is set to 200. Notice that it's a little more jagged over on the uh, high voltage side because it's a gas discharge. So before it was just a resistor, now it's a gas discharge, it's a little jitter there. But you turn it off, you turn it on, and you get excess heat. Uh, and that seems fairly well correlated. I think that even Peter can see that across the room, that it, yeah, there's heat there, because he always wants to be able to see that across the room, that big of signal. The next thing is it's correlated to which isotope we use. This is a little more complicated. We start off with the hydrogen, and in that region there that I've got mark replacement, uh, you notice it's real jittery because we're pu pulling out the hydrogen, putting in deuterium, we're push, pull, push, pull to clean it out. Sometimes it gets out easily, sometimes it doesn't. It depends on how long it's been running with the hydrogen in there, how 
uh, much pressure we use and that sort and the temperature. But eventually, uh, it's replaced with the deuterium. And notice we now have the red line. The, the output is above the input. Uh, it's still a little spiky and all because it's, we're still putting in the deuterium to keep the pressure up to about, I think this one is uh, 12 tor. Uh, our maximum is around 10 watts. 10 watts is sort of a really good day for us. Uh, we have five to seven, seven watts for weeks on the end uh, on a good system. Three to five watts is what we have normally, okay, uh, if it works at all, and it usually does. Uh, sometimes it's hard to replace the deuterium with the hydrogen once it's exposed. Normally we start with deuterium, and then you kill it with the hydrogen, and then you sometimes can recover it, many times, but uh, sometimes it's a little bit hard. Um, to me, as a biophysicist, really, I th treat that as an inhibited uh, competitive comp uh, situation where it's clogging up some sort of active sites and the hydrogen's in there where the deuterium wants to be so it doesn't pull it out. So we don't always recover it. Uh, here's a typical screenshot. In the upper left, notice you've got the t this is a temperature panel, and it heats up during this region where the deuterium is. So the block itself, big copper block, is hotter uh, when the deuterium in there where, than rather than the hydrogen. Uh, the upper right is our voltage type things. That's our Seebeck voltages and the high voltage panel. The lower left, uh, that's our excess heat differential and pressure, uh, excess heat pressure. And uh, if you notice, we started with hydrogen, we're putting in some uh, deuterium, and I'll get to the right panel in just a minute, and then we're replacing it. The right lower panel, uh, closer, notice that we, in this one, we've got about five watts after we replace the hydrogen with the deuterium. While the deuterium is in there and a little hydrogen, we get some. And then when you take it out, you've pulled a vacuum, you get back to zero energy. So the correlation is that it requires high voltage to put the deuterium into our sample, and it also requires the deuterium. So both isotopic and high voltage. Here's the uh, calibration resistor. We ha made a cartridge resistor that's turned down so you can put it inside there to run things. And here is to see the question somebody would probably ask, well, how do you know it's really from that and it's not somewhere else because the high voltage is at a different place than the heater? We put the heater right in the LT to, to check this. And uh, so it's near the same place. So we start with the block heater at 200. Here we've stepped up the, the calibration resistor. On the left is the power total divided by two. We really have two resistors on either side of the block. And uh, what I want to call attention to is right in here, 80 watts into the calibration resistor. The Seebeck voltage is around 4 volts, 3.89. Then we switch it. We turn off the heater in the heat, uh, calibration heater and add it to the block from the block heaters. Uh, so it's on the outside rather than the inside. And notice the Seebeck is virtually the same voltage. And when you run it through the calibration, it's fractions of a percent different. Eh. So it, it's good regardless of the position. Now the block, the power back off is, he's, he's got this in his lab in his backyard. It's a 10 by 12 
dedicated building with an air conditioner in there set at 75 degrees. So we've got a freezer in there that's running constantly in the cooling mode, and then it has those fans and the heater you saw on the pictures uh, that is controlled by LabVIEW to heat it up to 25 in there. So LabVIEW is working, putting in power to get it to 25, even though the cooling is done. And if our block in the CBEC is right, of course that's dumping the heat into this air, which is our heat sink, our reference temperature, cold reference temperature for the CBEC. And here with, this is a resistance turn, uh, we're putting in 70 something watts into the resistive heating and we get a, a 11 watts having on the average going into the uh, heater inside that cooler. Uh, the, by the way, the time constant on this part of it is like eight and a half hours, so it takes a long time. Uh, and it's real jaggedy, but set 11 watts, add an extra six watts, round numbers, uh, and you'll notice that the amount that you've got to heat into this thing drops by 7.98. So uh, you're, if, if everything's going right, it's got to dump that heat somewhere. It's in that box, and the heating of that is a secondary measure. So we have two measures of our heat, and that's very reassuring. We didn't really know we had that till we started looking through the numbers, and oh, we got another measure there. How much heat? It was recording it all the time. And you drop it, you raise another four watts, and it drops up almost four watts there. So it's close, it's, it's within a watt or so on that. Probably, we do our error bars, Bob will cor correct it in, in his talk with uh, signal to noise ratio and talk in engineering term. We do the jitter and standard deviation is how <laughs> we do that. And yes, if you integrate that power from the box uh, or the CBEC, the numbers come out near the same, 903 versus 904 kilojoules after, if you integrate the energy, uh, the power to get energy from it. And summary, we've got 0.35 uh, grams of palladium in there. That's about seven microns on the inside of this uh, tube. It's a moly rod down the center for the anode. The magnetic field for the magnets is 230 gauss. The time constant of the overall CBEC is about two and a half hours. We set the box at 28, the lab at 75. Uh, typical running, where it heat, it takes about 200 watts to heat that thing up to 200 and something degrees, whatever we set it at. And our pressures, are usually between 10 and 20 tor. Most of our long runs were about uh, 12 tor. Uh, we can sustain seven watts over a long time till he gets tired and wants to kill it by putting in hydrogen and then it's all, the game's over. Uh, but to prove that it was there <laughs> and that it wasn't the calorimetry mistake, uh, it does require deuterium, it does require high voltage, and our ratio's about 12. Uh, seven watts with on 70 watts of high voltage, that's for you that use the term COP, that's a 1.1 type uh, gain or COP. Uh, that equates to power densities of around 20 watts per gram. On our long runs, we've gotten one and a half megajoules, which is clearly not chemistry. And I wanna say, on Thursday at uh, 10.50, I think it is, Bob Higgins gonna go over a uh, mathematical model, engineering model with uh, figuring out the, the time constants and the signal to noise ratios and all you that build these model, heat flow models. He's got it in there and, and, and that sort of stuff, analyzing it, and it comes out, his scale's a little different than ours, but the same, conclusion, you got heat, you, it works with high voltage and deuterium 
and uh, the box temperature is a secondary thing. So it's heat, it's high voltage and deuterium in the system, and it seems to work. And at this time, uh, uh, where did let's go? Yeah, uh, and you can ask questions, and my chauffeur back there, Let's, will answer for me if you know that old joke, right? <laughs> so, so <laughs> if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Dennis. We do have time for a few questions. A couple of minutes, yes? Uh -oh. <laughs> Ed Storms? I just have a simple question. Um, you have 12 torr of gas. Right. Is that a fixed pressure? Uh, is, is it sealed, and, or is this kept at, fixed, uh, at that th pressure by an external tank? It, it's, we actually are supplying it from a hydrogen storage material through it, and it's set at 12 torr. Sometimes it, you can see it soaking up and loading, and it supplies it and tries to keep it there. If it, it stays there unless you have a leak. <laughs> Do you see any evidence of uh, the ions diffusing through the surface of the material and reacting on the outside surface to produce water? The tube is inserted in that copper block and then covered with everything. So like any good calorimeter that I've learned from Michael McCubrey, you must bury it away. For, you never see it. So, But we've never seen any evidence of diffusion through uh, the the actual 316L, yeah, which is why we use it. stainless. Yeah, it's, a, it's the type that contains hydrogen the best it can be contained. So I have not seen that effect. Yeah, the 316 was chosen so it'd have a low diffusion rate. You take it's alternately, <laughs> you take Mike McCubrey and then Matt Villat, and then if this time, then it's speaking. Mike? You guys might be able to help uh, me resolve an argument that I have with my good friend uh, Ed Storms about. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not getting <laughs> 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 We're not getting No, um, Digging way back in time, we, went, we, we several times quenched an electrochemical experiment, D2O heat producing, by pouring some uh, light water in. And the effect goes away, but at a much lower rate than you would expect from the, diffusional, but the diffusion of hydrogen into the structure, right? So wherever the heat is being produced is being produced in a zone which is resistant to being destroyed by diffusional uh, influx. Now, it's a tough job with electrochemistry, but you guys can do it quickly, I think, if your time constants are, are okay. So when you put hydrogen in to quench the excess heat effect that you've uh, achieved under deuterium, does it take an anomalously long time to, to make that heat go away, or is it consistent with the diffusion coefficient of, of uh, hydrogen in? Mm. I've got an answer, probably not cogent, but I've got one. Uh, I, I did what you're describing in 2009 as part of that co-deposition experiment. I, uh, in real time, while the experiment was making excess power with co-deposition, I switched the electrolyte, pumped out the D2O-based electrolyte, put in H2O, and it took 12 or 14 hours. I'm sitting there for hours waiting for this to happen. This does seem to happen much faster. Uh, the, this current experiment, is, is the uh, uh, release damping of excess heat on, on uh, diffusion of uh, hydrogen slower than you would anticipate, or is it consistent with the diffusional time constant? Or can you tell because of the time constant of your calorimeter? Well, the time constant is quite long, and yeah. it's not some... Hours. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, or more. Um, the uh, short answer is I haven't looked at it with enough diligence to give you a good answer. I, but I, I suggest it, you do. It could help me with my argument with it. <laughs> Boy, that's one I don't want to enter. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. 
quick question from Matt to the lab. Thank you for that presentation. That was very good to have you two, D1 and D2, on stage uh, presenting the experiment. Um, I have a question because I, I saw on one of the slides that you named that experiment, uh, Capco and Keith Lee. Um, I was wondering about the power source you're using. Uh, is it a straight DC power source? Uh, for the discharge? Yeah, what impedance are you, are you using? Uh, the, uh, the best. I saw that Bob is using also this. Uh, for the, I found that the very best machine uh, possible that you can use is one called a Kepco, K-E-P-C-O. Uh, the they have the model I'm using can reach a thousand volts up to 200 milliamps, and it's very stable on its own. If, yes, did I, yes, was, uh, great impedance. Yeah, is yeah. that your and question? Them, yeah, the BOP series actually, the BOP series, that's the right. the Capco ones. Anyways, um, sorry, uh, a calculation from uh, just from some of your numbers, it sounds like you have a recovery of of uh, ninety seven percent, which is excellent for for a calorimeter. Um, and and uh, um, Ed Storms has been um, doing some electro uh, electrolysis experiment with the same uh, Seebeck carometer. So it, it, it's consistent. We can do gas phase, we can do electrolysis with this type of carometer. So it, it's a very good tool for everyone to, to pursue research uh, in a proper way. Um, and I, w I had a question also with the, the pressure you're, you're monitoring. Um, uh, how do you um, how do you measure the measure the pressure? Uh, baritron. Yeah, an MKS baritron. Okay. It's uh, uh, it actually just uh, plug it into the vacuum line yep. and uh, use a quarter inch VCR connections. Okay. And it just reads that it, it has a conditioner, a 270 MKS that converts the its readings into to a pressure. Uh, it's an analog. Thousand tor baritron. Yeah. Yeah. The 690, the 698. heated things. Yeah. And uh, I didn't mention this, but on the screen is our live running experiment. Uh, the gods did smile on us today. Uh, it is slowly creeping up, and it, by tonight, it'll be right on the blue line. You can see in the lower right, uh, power in is the blue line, very stable. And the red line is slowly inching up, and it will get right on the blue line and stay there uh, wow. unless there's a little bit of excess power. This is running on. Uh, it looks like you have here. conduction. Uh, if you look in the lower right section, let's see. Uh, lower right section, blue, the blue uh, numbers, numbers highlighted blue, is the power in 320.43 watts at the moment. And we're getting out 290.83 watts. Uh, so it's got a ways to go. We're at minus 9.6 watts below power balance. And uh, if this continues like it did yesterday, it was it got up to two or three watts of excess power doing this, go spiking up and going down. It's trying to release, but it's still not there. And we're probably out of time. Yeah. That's just a personal point of view, but that's an excellent experiment. Thank you. The two ladies have been waiting for a long time, so we'll just have two quick questions. First from you. Thank you. Uh, I noticed that you're using 200 milliamps of current, and I wanted to know if you upped that current significantly, <laughs> say to one amp, would you see uh, an effect in the in the uh, excess heat? Well, you've asked a we very good hope question. So. Yeah, we don't have a power supply to do that yet. Yeah. What there, if you put two power supplies in parallel? Listen, can we yeah. can we uh, hire you? I, I need to get rid of him and. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you're exactly right. Uh, Kepco does have the ability to chain their power supplies. I haven't been brave enough to do that yet at 350 volts, but uh, that's something that Dr. Cravens mentioned recently. So we can go to 400 and uh, 600 and what? Uh, yeah, because I think, and I think what you that really would want to do is jam those deuterium you're exactly right. in there as fast as you can so they collide. Oh, you're exactly yeah. right. Okay. And that's something, I have two Kepcos in my shop. I just haven't had time to... Uh, to enable that idea. But okay. It's a good one. Thank you. And I think it would increase excess power. The other way to do it is to reduce the di internal diameter and go to higher current density yes. by a smaller surface. Yes, yes. Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry, I think we have.